Habakkuk chapter 2. <clears throat> Micah chapter 2 is where we're going to begin uh, this evening. Thankful for everyone being here. Thankful that we had that time to uh, enjoy a fellowship meal with one another. Uh, look forward to being able to do this throughout the summer. Uh, we'll get it nailed down a little bit better, get our times uh, a little bit more aligned there. Uh, so that will all work itself out as we go along. Um, but what we're doing this summer is every week we're going to have a different lesson and a different speaker uh, from either this congregation or from uh, different congregations in the area. They're going to be presenting lessons from the book of Proverbs, uh, topical studies uh, pertaining to the wisdom that God has given us in that book, and then obviously in other portions of Scripture as well, uh, dealing with topics that people really uh, need to reacquaint themselves with uh, and what the Bible teaches in, in any of these topics. And so make it your intention to be here. Obviously, we'd love for you to be here to enjoy the meal, but make sure that, that you plan on being here to hear all of these lessons. It's all practical. It's all stuff that is, is very, very relevant to the day and time and culture that we live in today. It's timeless information. Uh, the message that we have tonight, the topic that we have tonight, as you can see, is uh, the subject of alcohol, and this is an extremely timely message. As Adam prayed in his prayer, this is an issue that a lot of people struggle with, uh, not only struggle with as people who are uh, users of alcohol, but it's also an issue that we may struggle with from time to time in understanding what the Bible really teaches on this particular uh, matter. But I want to begin tonight by starting in Micah chapter 2. And I, want to, I just want to make a point from this passage. Micah was a prophet that, that prophesied the same time as Isaiah. He prophesied, uh, as it says in the very beginning, uh, chapter 1, verse number 1, to Jerusalem and to Samaria. And so we know that he prophesied sometime between before 721 B.C. because Samaria was still in existence when he was prophesying. What he was doing while he was prophesying was he was dealing with a people that was, on one hand, very religious. They were religious in their appearance. Uh, they loved the traditions that were attached to their Jewish Religion. They loved the Passover. They loved the feasts. They loved the sacrifices. They loved the worship. They loved the fellowship that they had, the tradition, the history behind everything that they did. But one thing that they didn't like was the morality that was attached to it. They loved the tradition, but they didn't really want to hear anything that, that really dealt with sins and problems that they were dealing with in their lives. They were comfortable, they were happy as the most, uh, for the most part, and they didn't want to hear something that would ruffle their feathers in any way. And that's exactly what we have in, in chapter 2, starting in verse number 6. Micah says, prophesy ye not, thus they prophesy. In other words, the message that was being preached in that day and time was a message that was restricted. We don't want you to preach on certain topics. We don't want you to preach on the way that we are living our lives. Don't prophesy. Do not prophesy. And so it says, they shall not prophesy to these. So the people don't want the preacher to preach on topics that are going to make them uncomfortable and dealing with the way that they're living their lives and the things that they're doing. The preachers don't do that. And then look at the result. Reproaches shall not depart. If sin is not preached on, sin is not going to be removed from the people. And it's indicative of our culture today that 
we have more and more people, more and more churches, maybe even some of us from time to time have the attitude of, I don't want to hear something that goes against uh, the way that I'm li living. I don't want my toes to be stepped on. I don't want to have to make changes to my life. I want to go somewhere where it's all positive, where it's all Joel Osteen smiles and power of positive thinking, and you can do it. You can make it through it, and that's all people want to hear today. But if we jump down to verse number 11, it says, If a man walking in a spirit of falsehood does lie, saying, I will prophesy unto you of wine and strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. So if someone comes into the church building and they say, hey guys, keep doing what you're doing. I know that you are drinking and you are living life to the fullest. That's what God wants you to do. God wants you to be happy. And these people would say, now that's a preacher. That guy can really just pull out of the text what God wants us to hear. And doesn't that look a lot like America today? We want to hear things that make us feel good. And we don't want to hear things that make us uncomfortable. And what's interesting is alcohol today is still an issue that is along the same cutting edge. Uh, there are people that would rather have someone come in and say, look, it, drinking is, is perfectly fine. And it's okay, you know, and, and don't worry about it. We don't need to worry about social drinking. We don't need to worry about recreational use of alcohol. That's fine. And that's what a lot of people like to listen to. And we have a lot of those preachers out there. And more and more of them are within the church. But that's not what we come to do. We come to hear the word of God. We come to hear the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is never going to have a message that says that social drinking, that recreational drinking, or the type of drinking that we think of today, it's never going to be okay. So that needs to be established uh, first and foremost. Now, we are going to look at the book of Proverbs to, to uh, establish why that's the case. Why it is foolishness, it is unwise to, to drink and to drink in these recreational settings and to, uh, to practice this social drinking as it is uh, so common today. I hope that at the end of it, you walk away with a better appreciation for the issue. Maybe some things are clarified for you. Uh, maybe you've become more convicted. Or maybe your, your life and your mind is completely changed. Maybe you feel that it's perfectly acceptable right now. Hopefully at the end, you will feel otherwise. But before we get into the Proverbs, I want to establish a point. that When we're talking about wisdom and this is true throughout the entire series that we're going to have this summer, that wisdom, in order for it to really work, it requires us to have an honest heart. And so we, when we're dealing with these issues, and especially the issue of alcohol and social drinking and recreational drinking, we have to approach these things honestly and, and dealing with the issues in an honest way. And so I have three things that I, I think is important for us to recognize. First off, we need to recognize that when we read about wine in the Bible, and then we take that figure and we use it to justify what we see today, we're not actually comparing apples to apples. The wine that we read about in the Bible is not used, or the word wine is not used in the way that we think about it today. So in Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse number 18, it speaks of all sorts of wines. So this word wine in the Old Testament is used to speak of all sorts of, of wines. It's used in all sorts of ways. Sometimes the word is used to describe an alcoholic uh, wine. Sometimes the word is used to describe a fruit of the vine, a grape. Sometimes the word is used to speak of just the, the uh, juice of the vine. Sometimes the word is used to speak of the vine itself. Sometimes the word is used to speak of the vineyard itself. And so that's the way the word is used in, in the Old Testament. 
But how do we think of wine? And what are we taking that word to mean today? To us today, when we think of wine, and we go to a passage of, of scripture that speaks of wine, we take that to mean everything that's alcoholic. Just across the board, everything that is alcoholic. And so to us, these passages that speak of wine include wine, they include beer, they include hard liquor, they include all of these things. But that's not the way that the Bible uses it. And even in the context where the Bible is speaking about an alcoholic beverage, we're not comparing apples to apples. Here's what one dictionary says about the wine that was in Bible times, the alcoholic wine. All the wine of the Bible was light wine, not fortified with extra alcohol. Concentrated alcohol was only known in the Middle Ages when the, Arab, the Arabs invented distillation. Alcohol is an Arabic word. So what is now called liquor or strong drink and the 20% fortified wines, these were unknown in Bible times. The strength of natural wines is limited by two factors. The percentage of alcohol will be half of the percentage of the sugar in the juice. And if the alcoholic content is much above 10 or 11%, the yeast cells are killed and fermentation ceases. Probably ancient wines were in the 7 to 10% alcohol range. And to avoid the sin of drunkenness, mingling of wine with water was practiced. This dilution was specified by the rabbis in New Testament times for the wine customary at the Passover. So when we look at the word wine in the Bible, we're talking about something that is weaker from the very get-go as far as its alcohol content is concerned. It is estimated that probably if someone was drinking something that would be considered alcoholic wine, after they had diluted it with water, the most that it probably was in containing alcohol was 6%. Very, very low percentage. And that wine was, was something that was not created. It was not prepared for the purpose of getting drunk. Now, how do we know that? Because they went out of their way to dilute it for the purpose of not getting drunk. If they wanted to get drunk, there would be no need to uh, dilute the beverage. But what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about something in wine that is on average about 15% alcoholic, ranging a little bit in between those. We're talking about liquor that is extremely, extremely distilled and highly concentrated in alcohol. And we're taking those figures and we're plugging them into this Bible context. We're not talking about the same thing. It's like comparing uh, and saying that gasoline and diesel are one and the same. You know, you can take a match and you could lay it on diesel and it won't catch fire until that diesel heats up to the flashpoint. But you take a match and you throw it on gasoline, it's immediately gonna catch fire. They both come from petroleum, they're both oil products. What's the difference? Well, one is highly concentrated, highly refined, and the other isn't. And that's the sort of way that we need to understand uh, wine in the Bible. First off, we have to recognize that we are not comparing uh, apples to apples. The purpose of the wine back then was not to get drunk. The purpose of our alcoholic beverages today is to get drunk. That's the purpose that they are manufactured. And that alone should cause us to take a step back and say, hey, I don't care what the Bible says about wine. This is not what I'm looking at today. The fact of the matter is the Bible teaches us that we need to be sober people. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse number six tells us to watch and be sober. First Peter 1 13 says to be sober. First Peter five verse eight says to be sober. The alcohol that we have is for the intention of making us not sober. There's no justification, therefore, for drinking it in some sort of recreational uh, setting. Secondly, we need to recognize that the principle that would make us anti-drug is the same principle that we should carry into alcohol. So I don't believe that any of us are going to be against 
the usage of a pill to manage pain. If someone's prescribed an opiate, we might say, hey, you need to be careful with that. But if it's to manage the pain that they're dealing with, I don't think anybody's going to say, hey, that would be a terrible thing. Well, wine needs to be looked at, alcohol needs to be looked at in that same lens. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 23, Paul instructs Timothy to drink a little wine or to have a little wine with his water for the sake of his stomach and his often infirmities. You know what Paul is saying here? He's saying use wine as a medicine. Use the alcohol as a medicine. And it's going to have two effects. One, it's going to cause your stomach infirmities to be done away with. And two, it's going to act as a purifying element to this dirty water that you are drinking. Now, in those contexts, in that context, if wine was to be prescribed today or used in a medicine, I don't think that anyone would have a problem with that. And if you do, I just want you to check that and, and look in your medicine cabinet and pull out your NyQuil bottle and look and realize that that contains alcohol and that your cough syrup contains alcohol. But we're talking about a specific context in that setting. And we recognize that medicines are something that God wants us to take to get through our sickness. We have an example of that here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 23. But on the other hand, we would never say, hey, you know, recreational opioid use is pretty good. We never advocate for somebody when they get home at the end of the day to pop a couple Vicodins to take the edge off. We wouldn't advise somebody, hey, you need to wake up in the morning and smoke some meth. It'd be good for you. Well, why do we draw these conclusions? Well, because they're bad. And we know they're bad. They have been proven to be bad. You know, an opioid uh, epidemic is in our country. Donald Trump, in part, ran on it. And people were extremely passionate about it, and rightfully so. There are two million people in this country that have an opioid addiction or problem. There's about 47,000 people that die from opioids every year. There are 964,000 Americans that are addicted to methamphetamine. From the years 2015 to 2019, meth overdoses and fatalities increased three times. That's, that's a crazy number, because the number was already high. And so we say, no, these things are not to be used in a recreational way. Well, what principle underlies that? Well, it should be the same principle behind our beliefs towards alcohol. We understand that if someone has to take a medicine because they're sick and it contains alcohol, it, okay, we understand that. But what purpose is there for drinking alcohol for recreation usages? Listen, if we're going to be honest people, we either have to make one of these two conclusions. We either have to say recreational use of alcohol is wrong, that would be consistent with our other position, or we need to say that recreational drug use is okay and good. We have to become consistent. I don't think that anyone is going to make the conclusion that recreational drug use is good. So in order to appreciate the wisdom that's associated, we have to deal with these things in an honest, uh, in an honest way. Thirdly, I want to establish this principle uh, that, you know, sometimes we'll say the Bible doesn't in the Old Testament forbid the use of alcohol. And uh, that's true. It doesn't just outright say don't ever drink alcohol. And so we run wild with that fact that it doesn't forbid alcohol. But it does forbid it in certain contexts. And the context is very, very striking. And when we really think about it, this context should be what we look at. And the lack of prohibition, if you will, is not what we should look at. Turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 10 and verse number 9. Starting in verse 8. Jehovah spoke unto Aaron, saying, Drink no wine nor strong drink, 
you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, that you die not, it shall be a statute for, uh, forever throughout your generations. Now, there is a prohibition against drinking alcohol, and the prohibition is this. The priests are not to drink alcohol when they come into the tabernacle to offer sacrifices. Now, what bearing does that have on you and me? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5, Peter says that we are the priesthood. You and I are priests. When the Bible speaks of the tabernacle in the book of Hebrews, it's talking about the church. And listen to this in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. It says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And be not fashioned according to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. We are the priests today. In the church, we offer sacrifices to God. Tonight, when we come together, as we study the word of God, this is a sacrifice to God. On Sunday mornings, when we come together to worship Him, it's a sacrifice to God. But did you know that when you're out there in the world that you are supposed to be continually offering a sacrifice to God in the way that you are living your life? This is the message that we need to take from the Old Testament's teaching on wine. Not walk away thinking that because it doesn't say it, it prevents us. We serve under a better covenant. Our morality is not supposed to take a step back. It's supposed to take a step forward. We're supposed to become more concerned with living sober and having our lives and our minds set on serving God. And I think it's striking as well in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2 that he says, And be fashioned not according to this world. It's hard to do that when the world's saying, Hey, we should drink. It's good to drink. Drink with me, and we say, okay. That is not being transformed away from the world. That's being transformed into the world. I think that these points are, are very important to think about as we think about the wisdom that God has revealed in his word. And so going from that, I want to turn to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs 9, starting in verse number 1, says, Wisdom has builded her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has killed her beasts. She has mingled her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent forth her maidens. She cries upon the highest places of the city. Whosoever is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that is void of understanding, she saith unto him, Come, eat ye of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Leave off, ye simple ones, and live, and walk in the way of understanding. What, the, the, what Solomon is doing in this text is he is transferring wisdom into these various figures. So some understandings would need to go into understanding what he's talking about. So as he begins, he says, Wisdom has builded her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. The house of wisdom represents the life. The life of wisdom is one with seven pillars. There's strength. We, we have heard in Bible classes that seven speaks to the perfection. It's the perfect number. The wisdom, the house of wisdom is the house that is strong. It is sure. It is the house that's going to stand. And it represents the life of wisdom. The life that is dedicated to wisdom is the life that is going to stand. It's the life that's been proven. And it's reminiscent of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. If any man hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And when the rains come and the storms come against it, it's going to stand because it has been built upon, uh, it's been filled upon the rock. 
that's what we're talking about here. Wisdom is spoken of here as a house. It's spoken of as a life. And the life that is dedicated to wisdom is the life that people should want to live. And so he uses a number of figures here to prove his point. It says that she's killed her beast and she has mingled her wine. Now, what we need to do is we need to think of what wine would represent in life. What would wine represent in life? Well, wine is always associated with happy, joy, merry people. That's the way that cultures view drinking. That's the way that it's presented. That's the way that it's presumed. And so the life that is dedicated to wisdom is given a promise here that you are going to drink something that is different from the wine of the world, but is going to give you what you are expecting from the wine of the world. You're going to experience the greatest happiness. You're going to experience the greatest joy. You're going to experience the greatest pleasure with this wine. Well, what is that? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, Paul says, Be ye not drunk with much wine, which is riot, but be filled with the Spirit. The wine that we are talking about here is is taking in the good things that God has given us, the teaching of God, and applying it to our life. The picture here is you want true happiness. This is what you do. And it's going to be the case every single time. But that's not the message of the world, is it? The message of the world is that debauchery is always going to be fun. In fact, many people in the world don't think that you can have fun while being sober. And so what Solomon is saying is just the opposite. You want to have fun, drink up wisdom. Drink up the life that God wants you to live. What's interesting is in verse number 6, he says, Leave off, you simple ones, and live and walk in the way of understanding. See, that's not the way that, that the, world, uh, the world sees it. See, the world sees the drinker. The world sees the uh, the. the wine enthusiast as the cultured one. They're the intellectual. They're the one who is deep. You can go on Amazon. I, I, I looked it up. You could buy the Wine Bible. Second edition. 500,000 copies sold. And the little blurb that, that is written about it says that it is comprehensive, entertaining, authoritative, endlessly interesting. The Wine Bible is a lively course from an expert teacher Grounding the reader deeply in the fundamentals. Vineyards, varietals, climate and terrier, the nine attributes of wine's greatness, while laying on tips, informative asides, anecdotes, definitions, photographs, maps, labels, recommended bottles. Discover how to taste with focus and build a wine tasting memory. The reason behind champagne's bottles, Italy, the place the ancient Greeks called the land of wine, an oak barrel's effect on flavor, sherry, the world's most misunderstood and underappreciated wine, and how to match wine with food, plus everything you need to know to buy, sell, store, and enjoy the world's most captivating beverage. 500,000 copies of that sold. Because the world believes that sophistication is associated with being worldly. But Solomon says, leave off ye simple ones and live and walk in the way of understanding. You want to know about a wine? Learn about the wine of wisdom. And so we want to set that table that Solomon uses soberness and wisdom to contrast what people are seeking in wine and worldly pursuits. Um, so good times are found in the house of wisdom and the wine in this house brings true joy and happiness turn now to Proverbs chapter 20 verse number 1 it says wine is a mocker strong drink is a brawler it's interesting is that wine is personified in this passage. It's given two personality traits. On one hand, it is a mocker. On the other hand, it is a brawler. What image I, I like for us to get is that when we 
take a drink. What we are doing is we are choosing to ingest ourselves with these qualities. We're deciding, you know what, I do not mock enough. I am not enough of a brawler in my life, and so I'm going to put these attributes more so in my life. And it doesn't matter if it's the smallest amount. That's the reality. This is what we are putting into our body. We're putting in mockery, and we're putting in brawling. Now, what those words mean, uh, you can let your mind go wander. How is alcohol a mocker? Uh, there are a number of different ways that we can think about it. Uh, people think that they don't look as foolish as they do when they're drunk, but they are an embarrassment to themselves and to the people uh, that they're with. It gives people confidence that they really shouldn't have. Wine is a mockery because it's like, that horse that has a carrot in front of it and it's just trying to get to it and it never can. It's never going to satisfy the person and people always think that it is. What about this? In my experience with, with people and listening to them talk about drinking, it's the, the wisdom surrounding drinking is a mockery to wisdom and common sense. So let me explain what I mean. People drink today because they want to get drunk. Alcohol is expensive. But when you hear people talking about their experience over the weekend, they talk about how much they drank. Well, that is counterintuitive to me. If the goal is to get drunk and this is expensive, the best thing to do would drink the least amount that you possibly can. But it's foolishness. It doesn't make any sense. And so the drinker prides themselves on how much they drink. What difference does that make? If the goal is to get drunk, it is, it is stupid. It's a mockery to common sense. It's a brawler. So this would mean it's boisterous. It's going to cause us to break through of our, our morality. Um, and I don't know if you could see that. But alcohol use by the offender was a factor in 37% of rapes and sexual assaults, 15% of robberies, 27% of aggravated assaults, 25% of simple assaults. Now this is an interesting step. Alcohol is more likely to be a factor in violence where the attacker and the victim know each other. So alcohol causes by and large people to hurt the ones that they care about the most. That's a mockery. That's a brawler. And those are the things that we are ingesting in ourselves anytime we pick up to have a drink to take the edge off. Uh, but also, alcohol is a mocker because people continue to think that they can handle it. Uh, we have statistical and anecdotal evidence that we could point out, but we have biblical examples as well. Genesis chapter 9, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25, 1 Kings chapter 20, all speaks of people who... Uh, thought that they could handle their alcohol and found out uh, the other uh, otherwise. All right, turn to Proverbs 21. Actually, I'm going to skip through this one. I'll be happy to share that slide. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23 just for the sake of time. Proverbs 23, 18 through 35 is perhaps the saddest look at alcohol because it is the realest and most vivid look at alcohol in the Bible. Um, we don't have the time to read from 18 to 35. I want to pick up in verse number 29. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go, out, go to seek out mixed wine. Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes shall behold strange things. They shall utter perverse things. You shall be as he that lies down in the midst of the sea or as he that lies upon the top of the mast. They have stricken me, shall you say, and I was not hurt. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. 
When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. This is a picture of addiction. And how bad of a problem is addiction in our world today? It grows every single day. Verse number 31 is a wonderful reminder to us. Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. You know, before you take the drink, the drink is showed in such a way that it's to entice you. The word smooth, if you watch a beer commercial, it's going to be used in a beer commercial. It's still described. The same means are still used to sell alcohol. It's smooth. They show a picture of that beer in the cup sparkling. They make it glow. They make it shine. And those sorts of things. The, the, the presentation of alcohol is always good. It's always wonderful. It's always something that we would want to be a part of. And that's what leads us into the temptation. But Solomon's trying to remind us, do not let those things deceive you. I went to uh, the Budweiser website just uh, preparing for this lesson. I wanted to look and, and get an example of how they present themselves. They present themselves as a great company. Great product, smooth, sparkly, you know, all of that stuff. But then they have a... Uh, a hell, uh, community involvement tab or ways that they're giving back tab I clicked on that and there's a commercial you can watch this two minute commercial where Budweiser just talks about how they are uh, they're helping the, the disaster victims they're providing water, it's a great thing good job, they're helping the farmers, they're helping fight climate change, they're helping to build back these communities and wow, you, you think they are a good group of people, but they don't ever show the statistics. They don't ever so, show the 49% of people who are dying of psoriasis, uh, cirrhosis every year. They're not talking about the people who have increased risk of heart disease, of stroke, depression, stomach bleeding, cancers. They're not talking about the increased likelihood of sexual behavior and the damage that is done because of it. They're not showing that people will utter perverse things, as Solomon's going to go on and say in verse number 33. They don't talk about all of the things that are said drunk that you can never take back. They don't talk about the children that are born, they don't know who their dad is because alcohol was involved. They don't talk about the woman who was abused because alcohol was involved. They don't talk about that. They show the picture of it shining in the cup. And the saddest thing about it, is that these people get attached to it. They wake up feeling the effects of it. And as he says in verse number 35, I will seek it yet again. This should be a no-brainer for us. We can't be for the social drinking. We can't be for recreational use of alcohol because it is obviously leading to destruction. How can we be people who are about life and be for something that leads to destruction? I want to end, I'm going to move through those really quick. I want to end with Psalm 31 and read verses 4 through 6. This will be a very quick point. It says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, not for princes. Where is strong drink? Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice due to any that is afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto the bitter soul, and let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth for the dumb, in the case of all such as are left desolate. It is not for you, O Lemuel, to drink wine. And then he says it's for these people to drink wine. Some people think, well, okay, if I'm, if, I'm pover if I'm impoverished, if I'm in this lower class, God understands that I drink wine because I'm dealing with these difficult, depressing issues. And so I have, I have my scripture for that, but that's not the point that's being made, period. The point that is being made is Lemuel is being told why he doesn't drink. The reason that he doesn't drink is because he's a king. And because he has responsibilities. He has things to do. He has to lead people. He has to remember the law. He has to deal justly. 
He has things that he needs to accomplish in this life. He's not one of these people that doesn't have anything to do. The picture of the person who drinks here is a picture of a sad, depressed, non-directional person. It's not looked at in a, in a way that we should say, okay, there's my justification. It should be looked at in a way where we say, I don't want that. I don't want to be like that. I have to remember the law. I have responsibilities. I have things that I need to do. Therefore, it's not for me to drink as well. But I want to phrase it like this. If it's not for a king to drink wine for those reasons, why would it be for a Christian? Thank you.